uh, people from different cultures in Canada, including the Dene, uh, the clan mothers, everyone. It's, it's us working together to achieve a common goal, and that's to end the corruption, the, the rampant, blatant corruption in Canada. It's interesting because I've always looked at my life here in Canada thinking that perhaps I was in the better country. And I don't think that so much anymore today. In fact, when I look at uh, the state and I see the Americans standing up for themselves and waking up and rising up, I don't see that sort of movement as much here in Canada. Now, when Norman did his walk on July 1st, I got a glimpse of seeing that here in Canada, and I think other Canadians felt the same way. You know, it really looks like our country is tyrannical and going under a dictatorship in which um, it's looking like we are actually more of a target uh, than, than before, than any other country perhaps. With the global economy being in shambles and central bankers moving towards a reset, it's never been a better time to protect your wealth by owning precious metals. Contact Andy at milesfranklin.com. Tell him Sarah sent you. He promised me he will guarantee you the lowest price anywhere in the country. Remember, email Andy at milesfranklin.com and tell him Sarah sent you. It's never been a better time to protect your future than now. Welcome to Business Game Changers. I'm Sarah Westall. I have Amina Matala and Norman Traversy coming to the program. Those names probably won't be familiar with a lot of you, but people in Canada probably very much know the Traversy name. His family was the one that when we had the Revolutionary War here against the, the British, he in Canada, his family led that revolution up there. They lost. We won. And his ancestor was thrown in jail and there were he had to pay reparations and all these other things. He was a very wealthy family. But anyways, his story and Amina, they're activists. What's going on in Canada is is crazy. They are under the Commonwealth just like Australia is and New Zealand and the craziness that's going on there is happening for the most part in Canada, it's not as bad as what we're seeing in Australia yet, but it's worse than it is here. They absolutely have no representation right now. Justin Trudeau has taken over the entire country as a dictator. And Norman comes on and tells his story as a, he was a firefighter and the abuses that are going on in Canadian society that's been percolating for a while. And now this is happening. He has an amazing story about this trial that he has against Justin Trudeau, against the Canadian government, and the absolute corruption of how the trial went on without him. It, it's an amazing story. And so he talks about that, and you get to see just how corrupt it is. But many Canadians just don't. They're waking up to this, but they just don't. Because they've been in a bubble for so long, our media has been a bubble for so long long that people have a hard time breaking out of it. They just can't believe that they have been deceived for so long and that this was is actually going on. And you can see it here in this country where we have basic lies that they're telling in the media and they just keep perpetuating. It doesn't matter what the facts are. They say you got to listen to the scientists, but I have scientists, groups of scientists, you know, reams. I just had a letter that I posted on my website from the Belgian scientists and doctors. Hundreds of them signed this open letter to end all the lockdowns and they gave tons of reasons and they went through every reason. Why aren't those scientists being listened to? Why is it just the, I mean, there's just so much hypocrisy. Why are we letting 10 times more people die from the mandates and cripple our society in, in a situation where the deaths aren't that bad? It, when you, they aren't changing the CDC numbers. They're keeping the CD, even though the CDC itself has come out and said, hey, these are higher based on the comorbidities. No, they have to exaggerate, make sure they use every single one. CNN puts the counter on nonstop. For people who are still in this matrix, this, I don't like the word matrix because it reminds me of a Hollywood movie. 
I, I like to just say this mass mind control. I mean, it's just this bubble of illusion. They're being lied to. It's propaganda nonstop without understanding any re- a semblance of truth. There was a Chinese scientist that com- came on. Tucker Carlson interviewed her. She talked about the fact that this was a bioweapon and that she actually published reports in Lancet and everything else. She was a very well-respected scientist. After she came out and said that, they deleted her Twitter account, all social media. None of the other uh, mass media companies will even interview her. It is so absurd what we're dealing with. And the fact that the there's still anyone in this country that that believes this garbage i it's just and and why is there so many people at universities that seem to be believing this garbage i mean we say that universities are they're they, they have this arrogance that they're very educated and so that education closes their mind down and they just think they know everything and they're also scared because we have these pillars institutions and they're they're not doing it they're not standing up for anything they're 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 awful. I mean, what is this? It's almost like they're destroying their own credibility by having no backbone and by being brainwashed to this level. No matter what, the fact that we're allowing 10 times more people, this is based on a study that was done. That is 10, and that was very conservative using CDC numbers. It was a revolver study. They And I posted it on my website. And there was multiple doctors and PhDs that put this study together. And they were saying 10 times more deaths, human lives have been lost from the the lockdowns and the mandates than from the actual virus. And this is using CDC numbers before you actually uh, redo the numbers based on the new CDC uh, admitting that there's there's been false positive or there's people who are considered positive for COVID that were never tested and then all the comorbidities. So those numbers are extremely higher than they should be. But using that those numbers, it's still 10 times more. Canada, according to Rocco Galati in his lawsuit, which includes even the top pediatric hospital in the world, is saying that there are 14 times more deaths in Canada. And that's using their official numbers. South Africa is talking about 29 times using the official numbers. So what really, how much worse is it really? And and so ca- Canadians are starting to wake up to this, but not not like they should be. And so we're bringing these guys on to talk about what's really going on. The, the fearful thing about what's going on in Canada is they're so close to us. I mean, if what's happening in Australia and New Zealand, if that happens in Canada, how will that affect us? I mean, we've already talked about Justin Trudeau allowing uh, Chinese troops into Canada. Chinese troops are actually going to be administering their vaccine. I mean, what the hell is going on? That you can Google up. It's in it's in mass media that they're going to be doing their vaccine. So uh, bringing these, th- these guys on to talk about Canada and what's going on is very important to people in the United States and very important to people around the world. Another thing the media is not covering are all the protests going on in Europe. I caught this firsthand when there were protests going on in Germany. There were millions of people out there protesting. Our media in our country, in the United States, in the Western media, were saying that the German uh, authorities shut down all the protests because of they weren't wearing masks and they weren't social distancing. It was story after story after story while I was watching live the protests going on with no crackdown. And so I posted that out and said, people, do your own search. Look, the Google is all these websites. You can Google, you can use any kind of search because they were all all the mainstream media sites were saying that the protests were shut down by the authorities. It was like article after article after article. Meanwhile, the independent media was showing live the actual protests that were not being shut down. So we are in, I mean, imagine what are, what other things are they censoring us on? I'm finding a thing after thing that's being censored, just little things. I mean, it doesn't matter how many things do they censor us on and how warped is our view of what our life really is. And 
you know, when you look at the people in our country who are still brainwashed because they have been so controlled for so long with every little lie. And, you know, the more that we point out what I did, you know, with the German protesting going on and then the, the false headlines, the more we can show that in real time. The Internet has been our friend in that way. Yeah, they're going to use the Internet to crack down on us and watch everything that we're doing. But we're going to watch everything they're doing and we're going to point it out as much as we can because that's the truth. So we have Amina and Norman coming to the program and they are going to talk about what they're doing and how they're trying to build this movement. We need the Canadians to rise up. We don't want that kind of tyranny just to the north of our border. So I'm really glad to have them on. Plus, I have a lot of Canadians that listen and watch the show. So I care about them like I care about everybody else in the world and, of course, my home country of the United States. And and before we get into that, I do want to tell patrons that I have a special exclusives that I'm doing. I'm doing some interviews, but I lately have been doing some special reports that I've been putting together and putting up on Patreon. So if you want to see that, you can see that. It's exclusive for patrons. And I also have um, a special report that I'm going to be doing that I'm going to be uploading after this one that's going to be on all the different ways that they're ballot harvesting. There's been whistleblowers coming out. We just had the Project Veritas. I did a show with Dave Janda on all the different ways that they can rig the system. And the Project Veritas actually proved out some of the things that the whistleblowers, but there's much more than just that. I don't know how we can secure an election without just voting in person. And how can somebody be sure that their vote is secret? I mean, we see all the persecution that's going on if you support Trump. How do people ensure that they have the right to privacy of their own voting and have the right to vote if all this ballot harvesting is going on? And so listen to my show. I talk about all the different ways that whistleblowers are coming out and discussing how they are harvest balloting, how they're stealing the election. And this isn't just automated. This is all the different ways that they're doing it through ballot harvesting. That's a very serious issue with these mail-in ballots. So you can watch that at patreon.com under Sarah Westall. And also, I want to remind you, you have I have $50 free gift cards. If you want to try the Zeolite, if you get the pack, which is the Zeolite gut and the Zeolite whole body at the nano level, with the $50 card, you essentially get the Zeolite, the whole body for free, and then you just pay for the gut. And then you get a whole body and you can try it with all the chemtrails, with all the fires, with with all the nanotechnology, everything, everybody needs this. That's why I am starting to say my two products that I'm recommending and I use every day, everyone in my family uses every day, my parents use it, everyone I talk to, I try to tell them to use it. I really believe in it that you use the C60 gel caps that get rid of all those uh, free radicals It's amazing how your body can heal and then get rid of all the toxins and the heavy minerals and heavy metals that are in your body. You really, not heavy minerals, but heavy metals that are in your body. You really need to do these things to to get back to health. I know that it can get expensive, but it's a lot less expensive than dealing with really poor health. So let's get into this important interview now with Amina and Norman. Hello, Norman and Amina. Thank you so much for joining the program. Well, thank you. Hi, Sarah. Thanks for having us on. Absolutely. You have a really good movement that you're forming and you're starting in Canada. You've been going for a while. And to the point where uh, what Trump's son, uh, Don Jr., actually uh, called out to you guys right on Twitter for what's going on in Canada, which is really Cool. I think it's great that you guys are making that kind of impression. But I wanted to talk about what your movement is. And then I really wanted to talk about your background, Norman, because the story, your court story, really gives people a good idea of what you are facing in Canada. And what, you know, frankly, we are facing a lot of that here in the United States. It's just different. We, they can't be as blatantly corrupt as they are in Canada. It looks, sounds to me, although we are very corrupt, we do it differently. So can, first, can you talk about what your movement is? And then I, Norman, I want to talk about your specific situation. Our movement is, uh, it's grown organically. It's bringing people together uh, from all over, uh, all all aspects of Canada, uh, people from different cultures in Canada. 
including the Dene, uh, the clan mothers, everyone. It's, it's us working together to achieve a common goal, and that's to, to end the corruption, the, the rampant, blatant corruption in Canada. And why now? I mean, I, you know, I, is it, it's, to me, I think it's the worst I've ever seen across the world. And Canada is uh, one of those places. And I, I think it's also because the Crown has more influence on you like they do on Australia. Uh, but Canada seems to be one of those places that are just getting nailed right now with the lockdowns and everything going on. Do you want to answer, Amina? Why now? Um, that's a great question, Sarah. Like, it's interesting because I've always looked at my life here in Canada thinking that perhaps I was in the better country. And I don't think that so much anymore today. In fact, when I look at uh, the States and I see the Americans standing up for themselves and waking up and rising up, I don't see that sort of movement as much here in Canada. Now, when Norman did his walk on July 1st, I got a glimpse of seeing that here in Canada. And I think other Canadians felt the same way, where they hadn't seen that before. So we we were um, given the opportunity to hear them tell us that, that you know, there are other Canadians who are thinking this way. So, I, th you know, it really looks like our country is tyrannical and going under a dictatorship in which um, it's looking like we are actually more of a target uh, than, than before, than any other country perhaps. And Canadians are, you know, they're really not aware. I don't think they are aware as much as I thought we could have been. And so there's a need for that. And I think this is why Norman and I have joined together and continuing the movement and and trying to rise um, up with the Canadians and become more aware of our situation. It's really crucial. It's really important right now. So um, do you want to add to that, Norman? Yeah, um, things are coming to a head here in Canada. Uh, we have been told by a member of parliament that we're living under a dictatorship. Uh, I know for a fact that we have no human rights, uh, that the uh, Charter of Rights and Freedoms that's written into our constitution apparently only applies to the federal government and employees of the federal government. I've got that in writing from the Federal Court of Canada. So we're on our own. And, uh, you know, we hang together or hang separately. I've seen what's going on in Australia, not firsthand, obviously, but Australia is very much like Canada in the way that it was set up. I think Australia is even in a little worse condition than you. There are lockdowns like Melbourne. I think they had 70 cases of coronavirus, but they're on strict lockdown, for example. I just saw a story this morning of two elderly women walking through the park and that they needed to take a break to rest on the bench and five officers came up to arrest them because they happened to be resting. Same with a pregnant woman who was nine months pregnant two weeks before she was going to give birth, walking through the park, sitting on a bench, and they just can't sit. It's the coronavirus, the stupid mandates, and they can only leave their house for four reasons and they can only leave for an hour. So they are really in strict lockdown. Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing it worse in the countries that are affected directly, Australia and uh, Canada. Australia worse than Canada, but Canada worse than the United States, although the United States is pretty bad. In Democrat-run areas were really bad, especially like California. But I wanted to ask you, uh, Norman, what your situation was, because I was very uh, moved by your story of what you went through. And it really gave people an idea of how corrupt Canada is and what you are facing there and how, how it just is, is fundamentally uh, anti-human. It is. Uh, my background, I was a city of Mississauga firefighter. I actually fought fires. A lot of people on the fire department don't fight fires. You know, they fix the trucks or do payroll or whatever. And I was uh, injured several times uh, over my career. I uh, suffered a number of concussions, uh, fell through a floor in one fire, had a roof collapse on my head in another one, 
Uh, I was just looking at a document today that showed uh, some of the uh, chemicals I was exposed to that fried my lungs. And uh, after my last injury, uh, I could no longer fight fires. Uh, so then I was put into uh, what's called public education, and that's where I'd put them. Can you, can, before you get to that, can you talk, talk about your last injury? Because and what happened to you in that? Because that's a big part of your story. Yeah. Um, this is my, the major injury was uh, I was in a, a laundromat fire. And uh, it, it was uh, totally involved. And we had to squeeze through to the back. Uh, it was difficult to uh, even get in there to fight the fire. And uh, I ended up on the end of the nozzle and uh, the roof collapsed and on top on the roof was a big fan to move the air around because laundromat, laundromats are hot. And that fan clocked me on the head, uh, took a divot out of my helmet and we got the fire out. I went outside and I was vomiting and that's, uh, I found out later, that's, uh, you know, typical of a traumatic head injury, concussion. And the chief said to me, take the night off, Norm. No ambulance, nothing. Uh, so that's, that's the way they treated that. And I drove home. Um, later, uh, I kept coming back to work. And uh, the last I did was... Uh, Someone had been knocked unconscious by a baseball, playing baseball. And we went out to the baseball diamond to uh, treat the person. And I couldn't stand up after that to go back to the truck. I was that bad. And uh, that was it. That was the end of my career. I, I spent six months in bed. Uh, my wife had to walk me to the bathroom. I couldn't walk myself. Uh, three years on a cane. I was on 200 milligrams a day of codeine. There's three in a Tylenol-3. Uh, extreme pain. My left leg withered up. Uh, it's back now, pretty much. And uh, it was agony for years. And finally, I got back to work in public education. You put on your dress uniform and you go around to churches and hospitals and in you know, schools, and you uh, assess their safety plans and uh, give a speech, give a talk, take questions, that kind of thing. It's a combination education and public relations. And I was driving to work 14 years ago, and it was a beautiful sunny day in May, and I was in uniform driving south on Mississauga Road, and I see a cloud of dust. And uh, I thought it was someone plowing a field, but as I got closer, I saw it was a fully loaded triaxle gravel truck riding the uh, shoulder at about 100 K. And uh, it went over onto its side in the ditch. And I stopped, called 911. I couldn't figure out why that was, uh, why that truck would have driven off the road like that. No reason for it. And I called 911. I had to uh, run across the road. It was leaking fuel. And uh, anyways, <laughs> uh, I had to jump a ditch. I knew that this thing was going to catch fire. I had to get the person out. I thought maybe stroke, maybe heart attack. I didn't know why this had happened. I figured I'd break the... Uh, driver's side window because the vehicle was on its side and I could just see someone's shoulder down on the passenger side so I figured they were unconscious and I would have to drag this person out of the truck and get them get them away from it. I jumped a ditch that was agony but I was pumped on a adrenaline. Used the air horns as a ladder to uh, get up there and I fell. I fell on my butt that hurt got up there and this face looks up at me and uh, we get the window down. I didn't have to break it. Got him out of the truck, got him away from there. He didn't have a scratch on him. He had dropped his cell phone and he was leaning over to pick it up. 
and that's why he drove off the road. Uh, the police showed up, Ontario Provincial Police, and they listed me as the only casualty. I could barely stand. I managed to drive home. I reported it to my employer, saw my doctor a couple of days later, and she said, you've re-injured your spinal injury and stay home, here's some drugs. And uh, I was supposed to be paid by Workplace Safety Insurance Board uh, for my injury, which first occurred when the roof fell on my head, and I, I didn't. Uh, the fire chief, John McDougall, called the Workplace Safety Insurance Board and said that I wasn't a real firefighter and that I wasn't expected to, uh, to rescue people on my way to work. Uh, at that point, I had a mortgage. I had three daughters in school, a wife. And because of that, I lost everything. I lost my home, lost everything I own. And uh, that kind of put me in the position where once you've lost everything, you don't care anymore about, <laughs> about what, what they can yeah, do to you. Yep. So last year, at, oh, and I tried filing criminal charges against the Workplace Safety Insurance Board uh, for uh, running an affinity fraud. And uh, they actually had the Ottawa police arrest me at the courthouse and escort me out of the court. And they stood there and blocked the door with their arms crossed. No charges were laid against me. They just physically stopped me from filing. And that was at the instructions of the Attorney General of Ontario. Well, and I want to talk about that more in depth a little bit. But one of the things that you found out is that this is a regular pattern with other firefighters. Can yeah. you talk about that? Yeah. Um, you know, Ontario has tripled the rate of first responder suicides compared to the rest of the country per capita. Uh, we had three Ottawa police uh, shoot themselves, two of them right in uh, Ottawa police headquarters. And suicide is a feature, not a bug. They, that saves them all kinds of money. Uh, rather than taking care of you, they just want you to go away one way or another. You learn that, but you learn yeah. that through how they treated you. Can you talk about how they treated you when you were on the job and the cubicle that you got? Oh, yeah. Um, I was uh, off work after the truck wreck. I was off work for uh, 14 months without pay. I was living, in, living off the equity in my home and trying to go back to work, but they wouldn't let me back because I'd made a complaint about workplace violence and also I was a witness in a sexual harassment complaint. And uh, finally, after 14 months, they let me come back to work. I was escorted to my new workplace, which was a four foot by five foot cubicle that had a shower curtain across it. And they had a professionally made sign that said Norman Traversy caged animal. And they be, and it was you were the only one that had that sign. Of course, yeah. And they were. What were you? What do you think they were trying to do to you? They were well. First, they wanted me to quit, and uh, second, they wanted me to kill myself. Like they knew I've been diagnosed with PTSD. I've got copies of interoffice emails about it, so they knew it. Uh, the health unit of the city of, city of Mississauga uh, knew about it. They'd actually sent me to different doctors. So that was uh, one they wanted me to quit. And then I would have been abandoning their accommodation, what they called an accommodation for my injuries. And two, they wanted me to kill myself. Uh, I'm sure of that. Well, because so many, oh, can I go ahead? Sarah, can I add that the PTSD that Norman's talking about, it's very, it was very severe at that time for him. In fact, he still has it, and I've witnessed his PTSD. But at that time, and we're talking quite a few years ago, it was extremely, it was extreme. It was quite severe. So it was very evident, very obvious, uh, his condition. And um, it was uh, a mental torture 
on on Norman, from what I understand. Well, and Norman, you have a case, and you were working with somebody who is very prominent in Canada, and you were going to take that case to, uh, I don't know exactly, can you talk about how that got built up, how you met this gentleman, and then what ended up happening? Because that is key to us understanding the corruption of the courts in Canada. Oh, yes. In fact, I'm looking at his book right now, Victory in the No-Go Zone, Gary McHale. Gary McHale was arrested several times for going down the main street of Caledonia, Ontario. And that's, that's what's called the King's Highway. It's public, public land. He was on the main street of a town that had been occupied by uh, the Mohawk tribe. And he was carrying a Canadian flag. And he was repeatedly arrested by the Ontario Provincial Police, strip searched, body cavity searched, and he kept going back for more because uh, he was exercising his rights as a Canadian. Anyways, after all this, he ended up filing criminal charges against the head of the OPP, Ontario Provincial Police, and um, also the Attorney General of Ontario, and he won. He won both cases, uh, private prosecutions, and he's uh, got the McHale principle, which is a Supreme Court principle, is named after him, and that is the principle concerning what is the sufficient amount of evidence for a case to go forward in a private prosecution? Well, I had contacted him. He had come to Ottawa twice. Uh, the first time they said the judge was sick. And it, this was like a, a, an eight hour drive for him. And uh, they put it off until uh, October of last year. And he showed up again at my expense, considerable expense. I put him up in a hotel and uh, he was standing next to me. He had spent two days briefing me and getting me prepped for my appearance at the Priyankot hearing. And I was feeling quite confident. We had a, a ton of evidence. We had thumb drives with phone conversations and uh, we were there half hour early for the hearing, I knocked on the door. It was locked. Uh, we stood outside that door with me knocking every couple of minutes for over an hour. And finally the door opened. Uh, we went in with some other people and the clerk of the court instructed us to leave because it wasn't our matter. Now how the clerk knew who I was or who we were is beyond me, but they did know who we were. And you were originally scheduled for this day, right? You had mm -hmm. notice. Yes. And then when you got there, your name wasn't on the list. That's right. My name wasn't on the lost roster, and it was supposed to be posted on the courtroom door as well. So you'd know if you'd gone to the right place, and that was not posted. After over an hour, after getting thrown out of there, we waited and waited, um, until lunchtime and uh, a well-dressed uh, woman in a business suit carrying a bunch of books came out and I figured she was a lawyer. I asked her if she was a Crown attorney and she said yes, but not the one you want. Now, how she would know <laughs> who I was looking for is also curious. Uh, we looked in the room, it was empty. They had gone out a back door. I uh, got a copy of the transcript and they had held the hearing behind a locked door and stayed it, which means put it on hold for lack of evidence, quoting the McHale principle. And I had McHale standing next to me. So that's the level of corruption we're at. So um, they did your case, they lied to you, said your case wasn't going on, and they did your case anyways while they locked you outside of the courtroom. That's exactly right. Well, can't you, because it was so much fraud, are you, can you go back against them for it? Because now you have evidence, you have, I mean, that's really bad. I went to the Judicial Review Board and they did nothing. 
Um, I can reopen it, especially now there's been another scandal called the WE scandal, capital W, capital E. And that's another scandal concerning 900 million Canadian dollars. And that's been put on hold, because the investigation of it, because Trudeau shut down the government. There are literally ball, uh, boards on the on Parliament, on the windows, and it's going to reopen tomorrow with a throne speech, and then we don't know what's going to happen. But um, they they lock me out. I mean, one time they arrest me and kick me out of the court, and the second time they literally held the hearing behind locked doors. Uh, so after seeing that. After living through that, I saw a video of uh, the head of the... Oh, and I've also gone to the RCMP about this. They refused to investigate. I've done. I've gone to the Ontario Provincial Police. I've gone to the Toronto Police. I've gone to uh, Peel Regional Police. No police force will look at this matter. And it's their own people that are committing suicide because of this corruption. And the last straw was seeing the head, the newly minted commissioner of the RCMP, Brenda Lucky, who is married, not married, her cousin is the minister of finance, or was the minister of finance at the time. And she's a political appointee and also the first female commissioner of the RCMP. And she is standing there in her uh, red serge uniform saluting with other Mounties around her in their dress uniform saluting. And while she's doing that, Justin Trudeau walked up to her, kissed her on both cheeks and hugged her. And I just blew a gasket when I saw that. And that was the start of this movement. Because it was so disrespectful to what she was there to do. And yeah. he dismissed that. That's what that. started all this. That's what got me locked out of the courtroom. It's like um, a jet being kissed by a president. Like you just do that. 